Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to the War for Badab. As promised, today we are going to have a closer look at the Warders of the Maelstrom, the four Space Marine chapters that had been given the honourable tasking from the High Lords of Terror to protect the resource extraction grid adjacent to the warp rift called the Maelstrom. These four chapters are the Charnel Guard, the Mantis Warriors, the Lamenters, and the de facto leader of the force, the Astral Claws. Do bear in mind that these will not be complete lore videos on these chapters, as many of their histories stretch even beyond the War for Badab. Well, at least some of their histories do. And so this video will concern itself exclusively with the chapter's action up and until they're joining the Warders of the Maelstrom, and then we will delve deeper into their exploits in the next episode when we get to see them in action for the first time. So let us start with a fan favourite, the Lamenters. And as luck would have it, I have already made a video on this particular chapter of the Adeptus Astartes previously, so if you want something that can go into a little bit more detail, I suggest simply searching for Lamenters on the channel, and it should pop right up. But if you are here for the quick and dirty version, the Lamenters are a successor chapter of the Blood Angels, making them the Gene Sons of the Noble Sanguinius. Unfortunately for the Lamenters, their founding was not an auspicious one. Created during the 21st founding in 991 millennia 35, a time also known as the Age of Apostasy, the 21st founding is often referred to as the Cursed Founding. The reasons for that ominous sounding title are many and varied, and it is yet another topic that I have delved into in considerably greater detail in a separate video, called the Cursed Foundings, but for a bit more of a compact version, the Cursed Founding was given that name due to the chapters created having a much higher rate of mutation and also renegade and traitorous inclinations than practically any other founding in the Imperium's history. Some of the more well-known examples would for example be the Black Dragons, who have bony crests sprouting from their heads and also long serrated blades poking out from their forearms and elbows. The Black Dragons have embraced these mutations and used them actively in battle, and the God Emperor's most holy inquisition have determined in their infinite wisdom and grace that this is a mutation that is stable enough to be accepted as within quote unquote normal human parameters. Whereas other chapters like the Flame Falcons were considerably less fortunate. They developed a mutation that would spontaneously cover their bodies in flames, that would mysteriously not burn the space marines, but would affect any enemies nearby. In a handful, this mysterious mutation could even be activated and turned off as well. In this case, however, the God Emperor's most holy and infallible Inquisition determined that this was a mutation one step too far, and ordered the Grey Knights to annihilate almost the entire chapter, except for those individuals that the Inquisition found useful, of course. And then there is chaos. Not only mutations ravaged the 21st founding chapters, but also traitors and renegades. Amongst them, the rather unique Blood Gorgons, who turned not only renegade against the Imperium, but also became traitors to the Chaos Cause itself. A fascinating chapter. 
And yes, indeed, I have covered them as well. But within this parade of strange, dangerous, and traitorous Space Marine chapters, we also find the Lamenters. Loyal to a fault, many would say, and cursed with no apparent mutations. And yet, their history might just be the most accursed of all the 21st founding chapters, save one of them, the poor, long-lost Firehawks. Lost, at least, as far as the Imperial records are concerned. <laughs> but, on to the Lamenters once more. The reason for why the Lamenters are such a cursed chapter is because they seem to be irreversibly unavoidably and intrinsically afflicted by a long and exceptional streak of bad luck. <laughs> now, at first you might think that I'm joking. Surely that can't be their great flaw, their tragedy, right? Their compatriots are turning to chaos, or bursting into ethereal flame, or having blades of bone growing out of their forearms. <laughs> Surely a run of bad luck can't possibly be comparable to that, right? Well, maybe it couldn't, except for the fact that the bad luck is so unfathomably persistent and of such a high level as to risk the lives of even space marines. In a heated duel, a Lamenter manages to get the draw on an enemy. He pulls up his bolt pistol to finish the fight in one clean headshot, and the firing pin of the pistol hammers down on a malfunctioning bolt around, which clicks and does nothing else. The brief half-second this buys the Lamenter's enemy allows him to complete the swing of his chainsword, um, severing the Lamenter's hand at the wrist. And of course, these things do happen. Armor breaks, weapons shatter, guns malfunction. All of these things happen, but they do so far more frequently to the Lamenter's, and seemingly also always at the precise moment when the damage of such a malfunction is maximized. And if it was just that, well, that would be one thing in and of itself. If their weapons simply jammed a little bit more often, their weapons were a little bit more brittle, or their drop pods occasionally fail to deploy their braking thrusters, that'd be a thing. A handicap, to be sure, but something that the God Emperor's angels can surely deal with. But it's not just that. The Lamenter's ill fortune also manifests on a strategic level. When they choose an ally, they break. When they choose a battlefield, it turns out to be a quagmire. When they strike a weak enemy, it turns out to be a recently reinforced one. And when they await reinforcements, they never arrive. And this is such a consistent theme for the Lamenters um, that their fame has spread far outside of their chapter's ranks, to the point that now many chapters outright refuse to work alongside them, which has on occasion led to yet further unfortunate incidents. During the heights of Abaddon the Despoiler's Ninth Black Crusade, for example, the Lamenters were tasked with the protection of the Kurila Hive World alongside the Mortifactor's chapter. Unfortunately for the Lamenters, the Mortifactors are a supremely superstitious bunch, and once they learned that they would have to fight alongside the Cursed Lamenters, they simply refused to lend aid, abandoning the planet and leaving the system instead. 
leaving the Lamenters to fight alone against the forces of Abaddon's Black Legion for six weeks, suffering horrendous casualties until reinforcements from other chapters could finally arrive to relieve them. For any other chapter, this would be a last stand of heroic proportions, a rarity, a day to be remembered and a vengeance sworn over. But for the Lamenters, to quote one of the best lines ever written, it was Tuesday. It was just another desperate last stand. It was just another decimation of their chapter. It was just another war that brought them to the brink of annihilation. Like so many others. Like so many others, in fact, that the Lamenters don't even bother counting anymore. After a few thousand years of this, you can surely forgive the Lamenters for having developed a somewhat melancholy attitude. And hey, they are still alive. The Lamenters had displayed a tenacity that few others could rival. And so, finally, in 587 millennia 41, they were granted the honor of membership in the newly formed Maelstrom Warders, alongside the Charnel Guard, Mantis Warriors, and Astral Claws, honorable chapters one and all, and finally, for the first time in thousands of years, it seemed as if the Lamenters would have allies upon which they could count. Brothers in arms which they could trust fully, and a unifying goal for all of them. After millennia of suffering and hardship, things were finally looking up for the Lamenters. <laughs> One might have thought that they'd learned by now. But enough about the unlucky sons of Sanguinius. You will forgive me, I am quite a Lamenters fan, so I tend to ramble on about them a little bit. So let us move on then to one of the Lamenters' new brothers in arms. Hailing from the very same legion, the Charnel Guard were also sons of Sanguinius. Although, unlike the Lamenters, very little is known about the Charnel Guard. A very secretive chapter, they prefer to operate on the very fringes of the Imperium, and thusly, their assignment to the Maelstrom Warders must to them have seen like a gift from the Emperor himself. Because it doesn't get a whole lot more fringe than an autonomous zone on the borders of a warp storm. As for the guards' motives for remaining such an elusive organization, well, there are several interpretations. One is that the Channel Guard have a history of purges. They are often the ones the High Lords of Terror turn to when there are situations in which uncomfortable questions need not be asked. There are those amongst the Adeptus Astartes that might balk at the more demanding requirements levied upon them in certain extreme situations, where only the most thorough of measures will produce the required results. The Channel Guard, however, do not shy away from such tragic but oft necessary actions, something they demonstrated during the creation of the Pentarchy of Blood. This was a temporary organization formed between the Charnel Guards, the Carcaradons, the Death Eagles, the Flesh Eaters, and the Red Talents. These chapters were joined by vast Imperial Guard forces, along with the Imperial Navy, in a campaign to purge several traitor chapters of the Adeptus Astartes, who had fallen under the sway of a false Primarch. I am sure it will come as no surprise that that particular conflict has an inquisitorial eye the size of the Golden Gate Bridge attached to it. 
And as far as the Imperium at large is concerned, the war never even happened. Nevertheless, though, as a result of this clearly fictitious conflict, the Charnel Guard earned themselves many, many friends within the upper echelons of the Imperium, those who knew that sometimes harsh measures were needed, as was demonstrated once more during the Malagatine Purge. The Charnel Guard was a part of this conflict from its very beginning and throughout its 21 years of continued warfare and clashes throughout several sectors. And what differentiated the Malagatine Purge from any normal war or military campaign of conquest was the heavy-handed measures that the Imperial forces employed, not merely out of necessity, but due to a direct order from the High Lords of Terror to, quote, spare none and set a bloody, fearful example to the realm of mankind. This was not to be a battle, this was not to be a war in the conventional sense, this was meant to be an extermination and an example. And whilst the death toll has long since been lost to history, it is expected to have reached into the hundreds of billions as several planets were found guilty of treachery most heinous and therefore found worthy of only one end, the ultimate sanction of exterminators via the application of the Life Eater virus. And once more, where other chapters may have balked, where less loyal servants may have hesitated, the Charnel Guard carried out their duty with great aplomb. And the high and mighty lords of the Imperium know to appreciate those amongst its servants with a steely heart. This may be one of the reasons why the Charnel Guard possess a chapter armory that is the envy even of some of the original founding chapters. The Charnel Guard possess an unusual number of super heavy armoured vehicles like the Fellblade, tanks hailing all the way back to the Horus Heresy. They also have a large fleet of Storm Eagles, Thunderhawks and Fire Raptors. The latter of which is a specialised design based on the Storm Eagle used during the Great Crusade. A very rare bird indeed. It may of course be that this fleet based chapter has simply been able to retain their armour and their specialised flyers better than many of the other formations of the Adeptus Astartes. But considering their heavy involvement in large scale conflicts as early as the waning years of the 33rd millennium, this seems uh, less likely than the alternative explanation that they have gotten a lot of friends in high places over the years. And mayhaps their assignment to the Maelstrom Warders was intended as yet another boon, since an assignment to an autonomous zone would be quite welcome indeed for such a secretive chapter. Though one must then begin to wonder, since they are such a valued servant of the Imperium and oft called upon to carry out special tasks, how long will they be allowed to stay on the fringes? One must wonder. But that is an answer for another day. Now we are going to move on to the third of the chapters assigned to the Maelstrom Warders, the Mantis Warriors. And here we take a rather sharp departure from the Sons of Sanguinius and instead head over to the progeny of the great Jagatai Khan. 
the Mantis Warriors, is an eighth founding chapter, hailing not directly from the White Scars, but instead from one of the Legion's first successor chapters, the Marauders, created during the second founding. This heritage would have a profound effect upon the personality of the Mantis Warriors. Now, from the very beginning, the White Scars, their parent legion, was a somewhat rambunctious legion. They did not do well with authority or lines of command, and so they tended to rove way ahead of the edges of the Great Crusade, engaging whatever enemy they chose in whichever fashion they wished to. The Marauders certainly embodied this ideology, and they were a very independent-minded chapter. Now, don't get me wrong, they would happily fight alongside other Imperial forces when they felt the need to or they saw strategic benefit to be had, but even more so than most Space Marine chapters, the Marauders were very skeptical of placing themselves under the authority of anyone, regardless of how august an individual it might be. It would be no exaggeration at all to say that the Marauders are on the exact opposite end of the scale compared to the Charnel Guard, whereas more, um, uncharitable sources might refer to the Charnel Guard as Imperial Lapdogs. Um, they would probably refer to the Marauders as uh, insubordinate wretches. Now, not in the sense that they wouldn't do what is in the best interest of the Imperium, of course. They are not traitors, secessionists, or anything like that. They just have a very firm understanding of what they perceive to be in the Imperium and the chapters best interest, and no amount of fancy titles or official paperwork is going to sway them from that point of view. And this, um, <laughs> shall we be generous and say self-reliant streak, has if anything been even further enhanced within the bloodlines of the Mantis Warriors. This uh, proclivity for independent operation and mild disgust with anything that might resemble a hierarchy was something that was clearly noticed sometime during the era of the Nova Terra Interregnum, uh, yet another bit of a civil war within the Imperium. There were quite a few of those. It turns out keeping a galaxy-spanning empire together it's a challenging task, considering the state of communications and travel. Hmm, hardly surprising. Anywho, the Mantis Warriors, after their part in this war, were granted stewardship over the Endymion Cluster, close to the Maelstrom Warp Storm. This was a remarkably visionary decision on behalf of whichever adept had decided it. A very rare, intelligent, administrative decision. <laughs> a rarity both now and 40,000 years into the future. Because the Mantis Warriors and their, um, hostility towards their betters would undoubtedly have caused a great deal of friction had they been kept within the more closer confines of the Imperium. And so, dispatching the Mantis Warriors to a de facto autonomous zone ensured that not only would they be able to operate as they themselves saw fit, free of quote-unquote interference from the rest of the Imperium, it would also remove a source of friction, both between the High Lords of Terra and a chapter of the Adeptus Astartes. Simultaneously, it would also provide a much-needed source of protection and firepower to a vital sector of Imperial space. A decision, then, that benefited and pleased literally everyone. The Mantis Warriors were granted their operational freedom well outside of view of the overbearing eyes of the Imperium, 
The High Lords of Terra were pleased with the security of a vital resource sector, and they wouldn't have to butt heads with the occasionally contrarian Sons of the Khan. And over the next few thousand years, the Mantis Warriors would develop their own specialised way of warfare within the resource extraction grid. The doctrine developed by the Mantis Warriors were both similar to and also dissimilar to the usually famed battle doctrine of the White Scars, who famously use a huge number of bikes and armoured personnel transports to launch lightning strikes against the enemy, destroying them piecemeal over the course of a lengthy war of manoeuvres. This is an unquestionably effective tactic, something that the White Scars have demonstrated again and again over the course of their long and storied history. But it does also have one undeniable drawback. Large numbers of mechanized formations require a considerable logistical apparatus to keep running, both in terms of fuel, spare parts, and maintenance. These are things that are all few and far between within the Autonomous Zone. It didn't help either that the Endymion Cluster, the area of operations with which the Mantis Warriors had been entrusted, mostly consisted of low development level feudal or feral worlds. In the case of the latter, there would essentially be no real infrastructure to speak of, outside of maybe one or two larger settlements that might possess a spaceport or some other way to allow Imperial explorers and resource transports to go down and off the planet. In the case of the feudal worlds, there might be something at the very least vaguely reminiscent of infrastructure in the form of cobblestone roads, for example, but they too would be rare, to put it mildly. And whilst I am sure that any true son of the Khan would be able to manoeuvre both an armoured vehicle or a bike through environment that most human drivers would give up on at first sight, well, we still return to the problems of logistics, don't we? Pushing a bike, for example, to the very edge of its performance envelope to go through terrain that simply just isn't suited for it is going to do quite the number on the fuel bill, not to mention the wear and tear. It just wasn't a sustainable long-term strategy, and so the Mantis Warriors came up with a variant upon this more famous White Scar Doctrine. They would still utilize their superior maneuverability, but they would do so in the form of their superior space marine physique, rather than relying upon mechanical means. Firstly, they became experts at antagonizing a response out of the enemy. They would strike at them from unexpected angles, traveling through terrain that any sane individual would consider entirely impassable for anyone with the ambition of carrying more than a pistol along with him. Over the course of several further engagements, the Mantis Warriors would chip away at the enemy forces, always disappearing before any real response or pursuit could be mounted. Just imagine for a moment, a space marine is infinitely superior in just sheer physique to almost anything out there in the galaxy, and encased in power armor as well, he can make an absolute mockery out of even the most difficult of terrain, and disappear up sheer mountainsides if necessary in mere moments. And even if, theoretically, the enemy might possess vehicles that could easily pursue the Mantis Warriors, say, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, helicopters of some sort, or hover vehicles, these would have to set off after the Space Marines without any real support from other elements of the enemy force. And remember again, the Space Marines aren't merely able to traverse difficult terrain with ease, 
They can do so whilst carrying along with them heavy weaponry, missile launchers, heavy bolters, plasma cannons, and multi-melters. And so, even if the opposition could conceivably pursue the Mantis Warriors, it would undoubtedly be a prickly proposition to do so. This part of the strategy, however, was not meant to destroy the enemy. It was meant to annoy him, to make him impatient, and to make him lash out without fully considering the consequences of doing so. Suddenly, one day, the Mantis Warriors would appear to make a mistake of some sort. They would launch an attack from an area not quite as inaccessible as usual, and the enemy might think, hey, we could catch them this time. And so, furious and impatient after weeks of needle pricks, they would set off in full pursuit of the Mantis Warriors straight into an ambush. And this is where tactics transition over into strategy. The previous weeks of small, needling attacks all served a purpose. They had the intention of drawing the enemy towards an area predetermined by the Mantis Warriors, and the ambush site would of course have been very carefully prepared. The Space Marines would all have covered and concealed positions, with good fields of view towards the area in which the enemy was going to enter. The enemy, in turn, would have been denied almost all cover, with the exception of probably a handful of seemingly obvious areas, a large patch of rocks over there, or a cluster of trees over there, or maybe perhaps even a seeming weakness in the Mantis Warriors ambush, somewhere they might be able to strike out for freedom. In the case of the rocks, they are filled with small anti-personnel minelets. In the case of the forest, it has already been undermined with incendiary debt charges, and the apparent weakness in the ambush, the clear route to escape, <laughs> that's where most of the Mantis Warriors are hiding. Over the course of the subsequent few thousand years, until their invite into the Maelstrom Warders, the Mantis Warriors continued to perfect this mode of operation, allowing them to engage vastly numerically superior enemies with relatively small numbers. They could dispatch a single company to deal with an insurrection. Another company could be sent to annoy an orc war off course. A third company could be sent to deal with heretical activity on one of the feudal worlds, and so on and so on. And they did a damn good job of it, which of course is why the High Lords of Terror chose to include them within the Maelstrom Warders. They would be a valuable addition of local knowledge and experience, since they had, for again millennia, been operating nearby in the Endymion Cluster. As for how the Mantis Warriors felt about all of this, well, they frankly hadn't had a whole lot of contact with the Imperium for practically the entire period they had been stationed within the Autonomous Zone, exactly what they wanted of course. The only organizations that they tolerated were the Ordo Xenos of the Inquisition, who did carry out a fair few operations within the area, and the Death Watch, who also often operated on the behalf of the Ordo Xenos. One might thusly imagine that they would have been quite resistant to the idea of joining up with the Maelstrom Warders, but I suspect that they may have welcomed the news instead, because the Warders were of course not intended to be an Imperial organization. This wasn't some cooperation with the Imperial Navy or the Imperial Guard. The Mantis Warriors were not made subservient to some arm of Imperial bureaucracy or administration. They were essentially invited into a fraternity of brother warriors that had the same task as the Mantis Warriors had always had, to protect the Autonomous Zone. 
And whilst I am sure there was a fair bit of murmuring within the chapter from the more solitary elements, who maintained that nothing good could ever truly come from involving themselves too closely with the business of the Imperium at large, but one must also take into account Signax. That had been an embarrassment for the Mantis Warriors. That had been an enemy who had struck into their backyards and had been successful in doing so. An enemy that the Mantis Warriors alone probably would not have the resources to track down and destroy. And it would appear that joining themselves to the Maelstrom Warders would grant them the resources to do so whilst still maintaining their independence. And so they accepted the invitation. We now have three out of the four chapters accounted for, so let us finally then move on to the fourth and final chapter and the de facto leader of the Maelstrom Warders, the Astral Claws. Much of this chapter's history has since been obliterated from Imperial records, but what we do know is that they were an exceptionally accomplished chapter. They were raised during the tenth founding specifically to face off against the ever-rising threat of chaos storming forth from the Great Eye and for millennia, they were not merely successful in this endeavour, they became a role model for many other chapters to follow. Indeed, out of the chapters created during the 10th founding, only a few are still known today, many of them having either been destroyed or fallen to the more insidious influences of chaos and eradicated either preemptively or after the fact. It is an unfortunate and sad truth that even the God Emperor's most blessed angels are not immune to the corrupting influence of chaos, and especially when fighting around the Great Eye, Inquisition personnel have on several occasions found it necessary to prevent a chapter's fall by taking extraordinary measures. Not a fate that befell the Astral Claws, however, they in fact proved themselves to not only be effective, but also apparently remarkably resistant towards the lure of the Dark Gods, and after having partaken in a great battle on Cadia itself during the Fifth Black Crusade of Abaddon the Despoiler, their pivotal contribution to the war was honoured with a chapter banner of the Astral Claws was being sent back to Holy Terror itself to be displayed in the hall leading up to the Eternity Gate and the God Emperor's Golden Throne. I hardly need point out what an incredible honour this was, and clearly the Astral Claws then went on to win yet further plaudits and praise from the Imperium, as some records suggest they are the father chapter to no less than three successors. Only the most loyal, the most efficient, and the most unbending of chapters are ever given the honour and the privilege of lending their gene seed and expertise to the creation of another chapter of the Adeptus Astartes. Being granted this ultimate recognition even once is beyond the wildest dreams of most chapters, to be granted it thrice is nearly unheard of. And for good reason. The Space Marines are a proud fighting force, but of course their pride is tempered by duty and the knowledge that there is no greater glory than self-sacrifice in the name of the God Emperor, but after having been granted this ultimate tribute three times, there are those who suggest that the Astral Claws were starting to become a little bit full of themselves. It did not prevent them from giving their best in the name of the Imperium, of course, 
and in the best tradition of a crusading chapter, they continued to lend their considerable power to wherever it might be most needed. Incidentally, gathering themselves a fair few new laurels whilst carrying out these selfless acts. There are also some darker rumours abound, however. Apparently, during one particularly ferocious conflict fighting alongside the Dark Angels, the Astral Claws were destroyed. At least those were the reports submitted by the Dark Angels. Much mourning was undoubtedly carried out on behalf of the Astral Claw's departure thereafter, but some 800 years hence, they re-emerged, and not only did they reappear, they were at full fighting strength. It is not unheard of of chapters to go missing for centuries at a time. As previously mentioned, the Mantis Warriors have had very little real contact with the Imperium, and there are even more unnatural explanations for why a chapter might simply just disappear for extended periods of time. Warp travel is, as I have talked about on many occasions on this channel, not reliable. And ships, even space marine vessels, have been known to go missing for millennia at a time, re-emerging as if nothing had happened much, much later into an Imperium changed to the unrecognisable from the one they left, just to them seemingly at least, a few weeks ago. But this is of course rather different. In these cases we are talking about a company-sized formation, a minor fleet, a vessel or two, a full chapter however, especially one that was reported as destroyed in action by the Dark Angels, who, whilst having a reputation for keeping the odd secrets absolutely, it would be an odd decision indeed for them to choose to tell the rest of the Imperium that a Space Marine chapter had been destroyed in its entirety if that was to not be the case. We could certainly speculate for quite some time as to what apparently happened to the Astral Claws in these eight centuries, but not enough in the way of records truly remain to make any solid judgments. Speaking of, we also do not know who sired the Astral Claws. We do not know who their Primarch is, or therefore from which legion they once hailed. Now, the more suspicious minded amongst you might suggest that the Dark Angels might have had a deeper reason for why a chapter could be disappeared for an extended period of time, suggesting mayhaps some connection between the two. Again, the Dark Angels have been proven on more than one occasion to have had their own extensive agendas going. But the Astral Claws have also always been described as a model chapter, following the teachings of Gilliman's Codex Astartes to the letter. And considering some of their later actions, I personally favour the interpretation that they are probably of Gilliman's brood. Their uh, empire building tendencies <laughs> certainly do suggest a certain communality there. But. This is of course pure speculation, and even after reappearing, the Astral Claws continued their service of absolute excellence to the Imperium, even saving a fellow chapter of the Adeptus Astartes, the Executioners, who were besieged by an overwhelming force during the action of Stygia Aquilon, the Executioners Twin Homeworlds. And then, of course, eventually, came the Astral Claw's greatest accolade to date, the command of the Maelstrom Warders.
And considering the Astral Claw's long history of supreme virtue, purity, and merit in the service of the God Emperor, this hardly came as a surprise. The Mantis Warriors, Charnel Guard, and Lamenters all accepted unquestioningly that the Astral Claws were the first amongst equals, and undoubtedly most of them, with the potential exception of the Mantis Warriors, looked forward to be placed under the command and tutelage in many ways from such a distinguished chapter. And on the face of it, it absolutely seemed like an excellent choice, a fine appointment to the Maelstrom Warders. And who knows, perhaps the Astral Claws could rub off a bit on the Mantis Warriors, another fine chapter but somewhat uncooperative. Perhaps seeing the plaudits heaped upon the Astral Claws could convince them to become a little more harmonious as far as the rest of the Imperium were concerned. As for the Charnel Guard, they had already proven themselves time and time again, and were probably viewed as yet another firm and strengthening asset to the Astral Claws' more illustrious bearing. As for the poor unfortunate Lamenters, they had already been brought to the brink of annihilation once, because of what was essentially a bad rumour surrounding them. If we were to give perhaps a little bit too much credit to the Imperial planners who made the decisions about the composition of the Maelstrom Warders, Perhaps they figured that association with the Astral Claws and Charnel Guard might rectify the Lamenters' reputation a bit, whilst also simultaneously ensuring that the poor unfortunates would finally have allies upon which they could rely 100%. Thus, the Maelstrom Warders were officially founded and organised, and whilst the task ahead was by no means a small or easy one, I imagine that in these early days a degree of optimism suffused this newly founded formation. It was, after all, made up of some very solid additions. And under the firm leadership of the Astral Claws, with the steel of the Charnel Guard, the local knowledge of the Mantis Warriors, and the unshakable faith of the Lamenters, nothing could possibly stand against them. We will see how well that confident assertion stands up to contact with the Maelstrom Zone over the course of the rest of the War for Badab. As always, I have been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and if you liked the video, please do consider liking it, subscribing, and sharing it around. Until next time, have a good day.